Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. This week we're speaking with a critically acclaimed journalist, author, and microbiologist, Eugenia Bone. Eugenia Bone, she's a nationally known nature and food writer and author. I actually had her previous book, which is Mycophilia. She's the author of a new book called Microbiota, or actually Microbio. Um, sorry, I'm in the Microbiota Society, so it always just comes out of my lips. And your story is fantastic on how this came about, and we're going to delve into that. And so if, if you guys want a fascinating story of almost reinventing yourself in midlife, which I did uh, in midlife, uh, this is another great story, and I really want to get into that. So you've written in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Food and Wine, You've had the Kitchen Ecosystem book. Um, so this is a journey into the unseen world around you. And it's, it's out now, correct? That's right. Okay. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think before we dive into microbiology, I think your story on how you decided to get into this is just fantastic. So can you, can you share that with us? Yeah. So first, a disclaimer. I didn't get a degree in microbiology. What I was about is I, I found myself in middle age reading these headlines about um, all the new discoveries about the gut microbiome and uh, you know, plant soil microbiome and stuff like that. And I just felt like out of my element. I didn't really know um, I really didn't even know if probio what probiotics were and, and, uh, and how they mattered to me. I really felt like I was at a loss when the world, the scientific world was speeding along with this, um, with all these fantastic new discoveries. So I, I basically went back to school to get my bio chops so that I could be a better consumer of this news. And it really you know, changed my life. But I'll tell you, going back to school in middle age was not easy, but it was worth it. And it opened my world in, in many ways, not only about what I was capable of doing, because as a writer, I thought my whole life that I didn't have the gene for science. But it, it turns out I have the gene for persistence. And that makes a big difference when it comes back to going back to school in um, uh, middle age. So you yeah. went for a, a year at Columbia, is that right? I and did. I and, went, and you, and you moved to New York City to do that, or? Yeah. I'm a resident of New York City, and I went to Barnard, you know, in the That's, Reagan era, right? Yep. I was an English major in the Reagan era. Um, and I thought I'd go back to, I knew microbiology would be tough no matter where I went. But I thought, well, if I go to Columbia, at least I'll know where stuff is. But that turned out to not be true. I didn't know where anything was. I was constantly asking the kids, you know, where classes were and how to work the water machine, you know, uh, the water distribution machines. I mean, everything was new. School in the 21st century is very different from school in the 20th century. But, you know, I muddled along and um, uh, I got a, you know, I got what I was after, which just was those chops that would allow me to, um, to make sense of what was the headlines, you know, the news that was coming in. So, you know, you, you have a background in fungus, uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Did, was your interest in, in mushrooms, did that help prepare you for, you know, getting involved in, you know, that part of the, of the microbiome? And the, the biome? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, it kind of did. It, in the sense that it whet my appetite to understand biology in a deeper way. Mushrooms were the window by which I came to understand nature in a more profound way than, than just somebody who kind of admired flowers. And, um, so, uh, so yes, studying mushrooms whet my appetite, got me into it, but nothing could have prepared me for the course look, the, the amount of reading and all of the definitions that I had to study in order just to uh, get through um, basic biology. Gotcha. 
I know that as doctors, like it weeds out all of these people when they put you through this like boot camp of biology. Well, that's true. Uh, they, you know, we do have to p pass a few biology courses to get where we're going. Oh yeah. But, but in in fact, uh, medical schools really like people who are, for instance, English majors, because you know it, it broadens our horizons, and it's great to have a writer come, you know, kind of into into my world. Uh, and so uh, there's so much we're, we we want to talk about, and okay. I. If, what I'd like to do is, I know you're interested in the soil um, microbiology and that biome of the soil. And I'm, I'm going to start, um, I was at a meeting uh, about a little over a month ago in Aspen and had the pleasure of simulta simultaneously talking with Al Gore mm -hmm. and Michael Mondavi, the son of Robert Mondavi. And we were talking about soil in the vineyards. Mm. And uh, Michael was saying that his uh, grandfather took him out as a young boy into the vineyards and he dug up a handful of soil and he shoved it in Michael's face and he says, now you look at this, you smell it. This is not your future, it's your children's future and your grandchildren's future and you have to take care of the soil. And Michael was saying that uh, at, they were addicted to chemicals in their vineyards mm. for over 10 years. Yeah. And that the, the soil had become sterile. And it took them 10 years to wean themselves off of chemical addiction. Yeah. So for the, for the uninitiative, what's he talking about? Uh, go. Okay. So um, plants make their own food, right, through photosynthesis, but they also um, need all kinds of micronutrients, as do we, like phosphorus, right? And, of course, they need lots of water. So my, uh, microbes in the soil uh, deliver those nutrients to the plant, like nitrogen, for example. And um, uh, they also deliver all kinds, not only nutrition services in soil, but defense services. So a plant um, can, will actually recruit from the soil bacterial mercenaries to help that plant fight off a, an attack from a, a pathogen, like a, a, a fungus that's attacking fungus. it or, or insect pathogen. When you, when we give, when we feed our, um, our plants uh, nitrogen fertilizers, for example, and phosphorus fertilizers, the plant doesn't need to recruit um, the microbes in the soil it, uh, to provide those services. Same with pesticides. And what the plant does is it gives up all this sugar that it makes from photosynthesis to attract um, the symbionts that will bring them, you know, the microbes that will bring them these, these nutrients they need. If we're giving the nitrogen to the plant, the plant says, well, I'm not going to give up any sugar. Why should I? And so the um, fungal and bacterial symbionts, they decrease in diversity. When you have a decrease in diversity, of course, you know this very well, that, that a di uh, when there's a de decrease in diversity, there's less jobs, there's less microbial life available to do jobs that can help the plant in a pinch, like warming temperatures, droughts, salt inundations, things like that. So our, process, our, our, our addiction to these fertilizers um, really undermines the health of the plant, and the health of the plant is directly related to our health. So, it, you know, it's a, it, there's a step, it, there's a, a you know an extra step there, but ultimately we're undermining our own well-being by um, feeding uh, the plant and not letting soil microbes do that job. Well, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to winemakers, and you know, not every one of them will tell you that great wine obviously comes from their terroir. Yeah. 
and that you know a great wine taster, uh, which I'm not, uh, can spot a terroir uh, you know in the glass and can identify oftentimes the vineyard or the year. And uh, it's fascinating uh, that this terroir, what the plant is eating and what it, the plant is getting from the soil uh, microbes is really essential to what the plant will eventually give us. Yeah. So, I, you know, I have a saying in my book that you are what you eat, but probably more importantly, you are what the thing you're eating ate. Exactly. exactly. And That's what the be, microbiology says, yeah. 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 And so one of the things, and as we go along, one of the things that has fascinated me, particularly learning about the, the influence of the, microbi of the microbes on the plant root system, mm -hmm. is uh, our gut, and we're going we're gonna to head there in a minute, uh, as you know, or hopefully you know, our gut is a surface area of about a tennis court. Right. inside of us. And our gut is basically very, 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 very tiny roots, which are our microvilli. And the analogy I like people to visualize, we know a plant's roots go into the soil, and that soil is full of microbes that are literally assisting the plant in getting the nutrients yes. it needs. Yeah. And so we have a root system that actually goes into our soil, and the soil Inner is... soil. <laughs> that's right. That, our soil is made up of the food we eat, but also our microbes. Yes. And so the more I can get people to realize that our root, we have a root system. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a way to look at it, yeah. And as you know, we have a, a very complex ecosystem in our soil that you so nicely point out has been marvelously destroyed. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, it's been... It's craziness, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been destroyed. And before we head to our root system, one of my favorite subjects, or least favorite subjects, is glyphosate and Roundup and what it has done to that ecosystem in plants and the soil and then we'll, we'll go into what it's doing to us. But you do write about glyphosate and Roundup. Uh, thoughts? Well, there's unfortunately not a whole lot of information out there. To be honest with you, I think there might be some suppression of science going on about glyphosate. Um, it's turning up in people's guts um, what kind of effect it's having. I think I read a paper not too long ago that suggested that there was um, uh, some destruction of uh, microbial populations as a result of the presence of glyphosate. But it's just what really kind of breaks my heart about this situation is um, it, the science that can help us really understand what's going on and, and lead to good legislation and regulation, I, I think is not being made available or it's being, it, it's, it's hard for scientists to get in there and do the work and to get funding to do the work. So I think that ultimately it's gonna have to be public indignation that says, no, 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 you need to tell us what it is we're putting in our bodies. Um, supposedly it breaks down, but if it's showing up in your gut, then it's not. Gotcha. Um, so let's let's go to the microbes in us and on us and around us. Uh, there's various terms that people use. I I like holobiome to describe the the whole mess yeah. uh, on us, in us, around us. And I know you've learned about this wonderful bacteria cloud that we yeah. we carry around us. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me, I've been fascinated with this in terms of personal space. Yes. And uh, so tell me, people are going to go, oh, come on, there's not a cloud of bacteria around you. I mean, I can see your aura, and maybe it's a cloud <laughs> of bacteria. Uh, tell, me, tell me all about that. How did you learn about that? 
Um, I learned about it the way I learned about most of this stuff. You know, I got the basics in school, the biology basics, and then I read papers, scientific papers. Um, so the the idea of this cloud of um, microbial microbes that we're shedding all the time is, I think there's not a lot of papers on it, but it seems to be pretty good science that's backing it up. Um, so we... Uh, according to this work, um, we have, you know, we're covered with skin um, microbes, microbes that are residents on our skin that are full-time residents. We need them. They're important. They help us um, not get an infection, which is why hand sanitizers are so crazy. We can get into that if you want to do some. Okay, let, let's stop right there. Yes. Uh, oh. Everybody's going into the supermarket or wherever and they're, uh, <laughs> why, why is that really a dumb idea? Okay, um, and I know you know this, so I'm repeating what you probably know, but the... Well, we're here for your audience and my audience, okay? okay? So, um, it's a sort of rule of ecology that organisms will fill a habitat, and the, um, uh, and our, our skin is covered with um, microbial organisms, uh, most, of the, the, most of which are symbionts. They don't do any harm to us, right? But they but they do good for us by filling all of the habitats on our skin. They, they're just covering us up like a little prophylactic layer. And what their presence done is make sure that there's no room for a pathogen to get a foothold. But when you use hand sanitizer, it's sort of like taking an antibiotic. You're wiping, you, maybe you're, take, you're uh, killing that little virus that you picked up in the subway or the little plague bacterium that's, you know, you got in the soil or whatever. Um, maybe you're knocking that out, but you're also knocking out all of your defense services, all of the defense services that those microbes that are kind of semi-permanent um, residents uh, provide. So then if you do get exposed to a pathogen, it has a better chance of getting a foothold because you've cleared out the neighborhood and a squatter can move in. It's the same thing as C. diff, to be honest with you. When you do massive amounts of antibiotics and you um, and you clear out all the microbes that are occupying your the interior of your intestinal wall, then there's up uh, and once there's sort of empty houses in the neighborhood, there's an opportunity for squatter to move in and that squatter may very well cause disease. So the same principle, and this is what's so useful to someone like me who's not a doctor. Um, and needs kind of general ideas to navigate this stuff. Um, the same principle that's true of um, microbial, uh, microbes filling habitats on your skin and that being a helpful protective uh, force is also true of microbes living in your gut. So yeah, it's, absolutely. it's consistent, yep. you know. It's, absolutely uh, true. Yes. Okay, oh, so yeah. back to the cloud of bugs oh, cloud. circulating around us. Yeah, okay, so you've got all these skin microbes and. And they're, you know, you're shedding them all the time. You're shedding dead microbes. You're shedding little skin, skin cells. Your microbial bits and pieces. I mean, we're, we're, it's a sort of, you know, an odd thing. But, um, but we're actually, it. These are a lot of transient organisms, so they're coming and going all the time. And the notion that. Um, you know, when you were talking about space, you know, like space invaders, someone who talks too close to you, you know, you could say, yeah. well, maybe it's because you're getting a little too much of their microbial um, cloud, their presence on you. But doctor, on the other hand, our baseline as a species, our baseline um, uh, uh, microbial occupants are the same. Mine are basically the same as yours. We have some variation based on gender or like how often you bathe or something. But the truth is, we're not that different. So um, uh, it's for me been a little bit of a revelation in that respect. Like I'm all about the hugging and kissing now because <laughs> I'm not so afraid of what other people have. It's not that different from me. You know, I used to not hold the, the subway pole you hold it with two fingers like this because I didn't want to pick up any, you know, germs or uh, somebody else's microbes. The truth of the matter is, yeah, holding the subway pole is like shaking hands with a million New Yorkers. It's just that they're not that different from me. So it's a really kind of democratizing idea, this, this notion of microbial clouds and, and how we, we're ultimately, not only are 
um, are, are quite similar, but uh, in a, you could even say these clouds are a way of defining family because a bunch of, uh, you know, a group, a family group living together, all those microbial clouds can homogenize, even creating a kind of identity for that family based on where they live and how they eat and the gender mix and if they have a dog and things like that. It's, it's quite poetic, I think. Right, yeah. In, in, my, in my book that's coming out in March uh, called The Longevity Paradox, uh, it turns out that it's, it's basically a story of microbes and the, the holobiome. And one of the things that's fascinating is families, as you were just talking about, share bacteria and then they share their microbiome. Yeah. And if they got a dog or a cat, even better, dogs are better than cats because I've had both. I have both, uh, but so dogs go dogs go outside and bring in more microbes. Yeah. But so when I take a family history from someone, I no longer am interested in their genes because our genes actually are very minimal in our fate. It's actually this huge microbe population population of trillions and trillions and trillions of genes, we have far more microbial genes than we will right. ever have of us. But you're right, families share microbes, and we know that microbes, depending on the bugs you have, are either going to make you fat or seek out fats and sugars, whereas other ones are not going to have you seek out. So one of the things that is intriguing, that is really hard to get people to grasp, and I agree with you completely, so that's too bad, but um, you're kind of saying that higher creatures maybe exist actually for these little single one-celled organisms, and that we maybe should rethink this. Can you go into that? Uh, yeah, it's a well, there's definitely that question of the puppet master. You know, if, if you've got microbes in your gut that are manipulating, um, manipulating the situation in your gut in order to get you to eat more sugar, <laughs> then it does yep. seem a little bit like a puppet master. Um, but, you know, when I thought about, and that's how it, where I was going for a long time in my mind, but then I thought about the fact that, like, let's, you know, if you back up and look at the analogy if our body is uh, if the if the organisms that live in them are an ecology you know different population numbers all living in either balance or imbalance um, then our the analogy would be our body is the environment and unlike a natural environment where weather um, uh, and uh, um, and temperature is uh, what affects the evolution of the ecology. In our case, it's our choices. Our choice is the is the analogy is the analogy. So we're the environment, and our choice is like weather, that affects the ecology of the organisms inside us. So, so ultimately, um, we are in charge. Um, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to throw that right back at you okay, because okay, in in your in, in your book, you get to talk about toxoplasmosis. Yes. And I've been fascinated by toxoplasmosis for most of my life, yeah, thanks true. to Robert Sapolsky. Yeah. Uh, and I hope you've watched his video on toxoplasmosis. Uh, and if you haven't, and any of our viewers, please look at the YouTube video of Robert Sapolsky from Stanford on toxoplasmosis. So you've written about it, so I'm going, to let, I'm going to set you up to tell us how a single cell organism can control you. Yeah, okay. Well, this is pretty cool. So <laughs> It um, is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So in taxoplasmosis, what happens is that the organism, which I believe is a protist, was that right? Yeah. And so it, it, it's, its life cycle um, involves uh, the cat so what it does and mice so what it yeah. does is needs an intermediate host who's an intermediate host host right so the um, the cat uh, 
I'm trying to remember exactly how it goes, but the... the so the, the rat gets infected by drinking water that's been infected by cat feces. Feces, right, right. So then the protist gets in the, um, in the, in the rat or the mouse, and it does a strange kind of little neural job on the rodent, making it less fearful of cats. It's actually not freaked out by the smell of cat urine, which is one of the triggers that makes the mouse say, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I better go in my hole. So the mouse wanders out, and then boom, the cat grabs it. Um, the cat eats the mouse, and the protist is able to go through the cat's digestion system and back through the feces and back out via feces. So that's the process. But the reason why pregnant women aren't supposed to clean cat boxes is that we can, um, it, is that if a, if a woman gets infected with the, um, the protist, which is, um, uh, which is, can cause like flu-like systems, uh, I believe flu-like, yeah. uh, yeah. um, but the, the problem is it can also be really problematic to the developing feces. The taxoplasmosis can is also been shown, and I think it's kind of limited the studies, but it's pretty provocative, to to lower the um, uh, to 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 cause behavioral uh, to cause behaviors in men and women that actually increase their risk of death, and the behaviors are really in intense. They're gender specific, so a man will become more aggressive. And that would lead to potential death scenario. You know, if he starts fighting with people or doing road rage or whatever, he becomes more reckless. That's what happens to men who suffer, who, not all. Yeah, you know, a great number of motorcycle deaths uh, have toxoplasmosis uh, in their brain. Yeah, it's completely wild. And then for women, they let down their, um, uh, their, their carefulness about um, sex, you know, about, um, they become more, um, you know, so sexually out there, more flamboyant, more flirtatious. And that of course can lead to trouble for women, big trouble. So it's interesting how these inhibitions get suppressed just in us that cause, that can potentially cause you know, a death just as they do in rodents. And yeah, there's like, there are lots of cases and you can totally call me on that where the microbial, <laughs> you know, I just read today this, um, uh, this study about how um, uh, germ-free flies, right, flies without their, back, their gut bacteria, are more likely to be hyperactive than yeah. flies with their normal gut bacteria. So there's like, this connection. These are neural connections. It's pretty, yeah. So I don't know. To be definitive, for me to be definitive about anything is stupido. <laughs> it's like there's all the, <laughs> right? There's this incredible variety. And so, yeah, you're right. It's, um, we, we are also puppets, puppet masters and puppets. So in, in, your, in your research, it, it, did you ever get into the controversy with uh, Louis, Louis Pasteur and his arch rival Beauchamp? Did you ever have an opportunity to, yeah, to get into that? Yeah, about it, but I didn't really report so much on the, um, I reported, I report in my career because I was really interested in the idea that why do we think about, um, about bacteria and other microbes in terms of germs and as bad, you know, where does all this negative thing come from? And so, yeah, I address a little bit the fact that we learned about bacteria based on disease, really, and that, and viruses and so on. and. And so when disease is the way you understand something, it's really hard to shake it off and say, but they're good. Yet the truth of the matter is, if, um, if all bacteria are bad for us, we'd probably all be dead. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and going back to your, your germ-free model, we know that germ-free rodents really have much shortened lives compared to rodents that have a normal microbiome. And you're right, these bacteria are actually responsible for making a lot of our feel-good hormones like serotonin, yeah. like they're, they're responsible for making melatonin, the you know, relaxing go-to-sleep hormone. Yeah. And so with, without these, we're pretty much of a, of a mess. Yeah. Uh, we don't do so well, right, without our symbionts, but we evolved with them all along. Now, people, 
you know, not people like you, but, you know, normal sort of not so well educated in science people like myself, we, it's really easy to think of evolution as being this linear thing. But the truth is, is that we never stopped being bacterial. I mean, that's always been a part of who we are. Um, and so this, this notion that, um, that you would uh, want to um, get rid of symbionts that are actually key to who you are. I mean, think about it. If we could get rid of every bit of bacteria in us, we wouldn't, or every bit of bacterial DNA, we wouldn't even be able to go because we wouldn't have mitochondria anymore. That's exactly right. And uh, so, and, and we, we talk about this in the plant paradox, but also in the longevity paradox. And, for those you know, viewers, tell us all about mitochondria and what they actually are. I think, I think this is the best so story. Right? I know, it's such a great story, and a lot of people don't know, but so about this, at the same time that um, MTV went live with 24-hour music videos, um, that same year, Lynn Margulis, um, a biologist, uh, published a paper and it became pretty much established science that the mitochondria in our cells are the descendants of um, bacteria. And so what mitochondria are is they are, um, they're like the energy makers in our cells. Mitochondria use oxygen that we breathe in order to turn the food we eat into energy to make us go, right? So I'm going right now, here I'm going. <laughs> Um, and and uh, to that to the to that point, if you are a runner um, and you need more energy, your mitochondria divide individually. I mean, separately from the cell itself. They, Correct. So that was one of the indicators that wow, they're they're a different organism. Well, it turns out mitochondria have their own DNA. Correct. If you if you broke open a cell in the body and, the, and your mitochondria leaked into your bloodstream, your immune system would attack it, recognizing it for bacterial DNA. So the idea of the endosymbiosis theory is that a, a certain cell type, maybe an archaeal cell, which is like a bacteria, but not like a bacteria, it's single cell, cellular, prokarya, it consumed, it, it, it engulfed but didn't consume a little maybe a little oxygen respiring predator bacteria, maybe one related to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, back, the, the bacteria that caused Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And that that cell type, our kale cell with a little um, oxygen respiring bacteria that it enslaved, the master cell enslaved to produce energy for it, is the type of cell that we are and fungi and plants, we're all that. And then plants went off in their own direction when they um, acquired yet another bacteria, the cyanobacteria, that's the bacteria that oxygenated our planet in the first place, they're a photosynthesizer, um, that cell type that we are, which is our kale cell type, presumably with a little oxygen respiring um, uh, bacterium living inside, uh, not really living, having given up a lot of genes, but it's like a, it's still doing the job it used to do when it was free living in oceans itself. Um, then engulfed uh, yet another bacteria, the cyanobacteria, that evolved into chloroplasts and are still photosynthesizing for their master cell today. It's like we're all essentially bacterial. I love it. That's, that's, that's exactly right. We're so just beautiful, a, right? We're just a big giant bug. <laughs> <laughs> but I think so, it's really so poetic, you know, that the, the most humble, the most smallest, the thing that we try to kill every day is yet, is, you know, is part of who we are. You know, it kind of opens my mind to a much more, um, as I said earlier, democratic idea of, um, of all, all of us, all critters in the same, we're all living here in the same world together. So how you're you're a cookbook writer? How so? How did this you know year change how what what your approach to food is? Yeah, well, uh, quite a few ways um, for me personally. Like one thing that I really learned from writing this book is the importance of fiber fermenting organisms living in my um, my gut. So 
Uh, you know the, the saying, which I'm sure you've heard many times, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, the new microbiology is saying, because it the reason why an apple a day keeps the doctor away is because it helps those fiber fermenters stay. And that's such an important thing. You feed those fiber fermenters in your body and then they produce these uh, little molecules, it's kind of like bacteria poop, that we need to build serotonin and melatonin, as you said earlier, um, and that provide this prophylactic role, protecting our gut wall so that we don't suffer from leaky gut and inflammation and all those um, chronic diseases that people have now. Um, so I'm all about the fiber. I'm all about the fiber and I really have, um, I pay attention more to that fact. Um, so I'm eating lots of, you know, apples, for example. Um, I also understand uh, probiotics now and how they're, they're transient microbes that, um, that play a role. They drop off good molecules on their way through you, in one in and out the other. Um, but since... Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And as you probably found out, the vast majority of probiotics that we take as a capsule or even eat in food are not resonant microbes. They, they're on vacation for a couple of weeks yeah. and yeah. then they leave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Was that a surprise to you? Well, yeah. I mean, doctor, every single step of the way has been a surprise for me with this process. Learning microbiology is just so gorgeous and complex. But, but in terms of the kitchen, I realized, all right, the supplement thing is really you know, how alive are these critters in your probiotic supplements? They have to be, they're, you're, they're supposed to be live organisms. Probiotics are live uh, microbes, live bacteria or fungi. So, you know, I make yogurt and sauerkraut and I don't can it, right? I don't sterilize it, keep it in the fridge. And I just sort of fold this, this, these foods, these fermented foods into my diet. It's not like I'm dogmatic about it, but I eat them regularly, just as a part of my regular diet. And um, so that was a big thing. And also, if something falls on the floor, I scoop it up and eat it right away. No problem. <laughs> because it's really so, not that the microbes that are on there are not that different from the microbes that are everywhere. You know? So the five second rule uh, doesn't apply anymore? <laughs> That's what I say, <laughs> five second rule. No, it really doesn't. Uh, it has more, the, the truth of the matter is how porous the food is that falls on the, the ground has more to do with the, um, the accumulation of microbes from the floor. And, you know, I really just don't sweat it. Um, if silverware falls on the floor in a restaurant, you know, I pick it up, I put my napkin on it, you know, I wipe it with my napkin and I eat it. I Good use, for you. you know, yeah. it's just not, I'm just over, you know, can I tell you a little quick story? Sure. Do you mind? All right. This happened after I wrote Microbia. But um, I was in the I was uh, I was in this um, train in that takes you from downtown Denver to the uh, to the it was a bus that takes you from downtown Denver to the train station where you go to the airport and um, this homeless guy or you know kind of like down and out guy sits next to me right and he hits me up for a little bit of money and and so I gave him a dollar and and he turned to hug me and at first I was like Wah! like this and then I said what am I doing? It's like everything I had learned made me realize he's just not that different from me. And so I hugged him back. And it, you know, everybody else in the bus was like looking at me like I was crazy, but you know, I didn't get sick from it. It was, um, I, in a way, learning about microbiology has made me a little bit of a better person, to be honest. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so have you changed your soaps, your shampoos? Have you changed your personal hygiene routine? <laughs> yeah, I don't really wash my hair. I get it wet when I shower, but I don't put soap and stuff on my hair. I don't bother with it. So I always have a little bit of a kind of bed head, which you can put <laughs> sprays in to achieve, but I don't have to. I just like get out of bed. Um, so I don't do that. I don't. Um, I don't use. Uh, I'm very careful. Not careful, but I'm more suspicious of, of creams and things like that because I want to encourage a nice diversity of microbes on my body and scalp, so they can do more jobs. I mean, I don't want that diversity to become truly complex because an ecosystem can 
become quite complex and you can get spiders in your hair. I don't want to go that far, <laughs> but I'd like to have, I'd like to have all the microbial components that, um, that can keep my health at its optimum place. I need my symbionts. I'm encouraging them to colonize me. Perfect. That's right. All right. Now, what do you, what do you say to the folks who are, are going to maybe think about your book and say, wait a minute, this, this is a crazy person with wild hair and she doesn't bathe. Um, she's, she's just a, a, a nutcase. Uh, why aren't you a nutcase? And quite frankly, you're not a nutcase. But in my humble opinion, how's Thank that? You. <laughs> um, because I, I came out of the science. You know, I read the science and it was totally convincing. I'm not... Um, uh, um, it, it was not a problem to make decisions about my own health based on good science. Right. But reading the science is the problem. That's what's so difficult for people like me. If you don't have the background, you're kind of screwed. Sorry about that. But, you know, it's really... Yeah, no, it's pretty nerdy stuff. <laughs> it is. It is. And the jargon yeah. is really intense. So that's why I wrote the book was because it, it's, it's kind of like a primer. A microbiology primer. So yeah, is it chewy in places? It is, which is why I, I try to lighten it a little bit by telling these silly stories um, of how embarrassing it was to be middle-aged back in college with a bunch of 20-year-olds, you know, younger than my own kids. All right. So uh, as part of my podcast, I always get an audience question. And so I'm going to leave you hanging for a second to answer this question. But it's actually almost apropos. So, and then we're going to come back and, and sign off, okay? okay? So, the audience question today is from Limey Bean. That's a cute name. Uh, I read that much of the olive oil we get in the U.S. is either fake or cut with cheaper oils. Do you know if that's true? And, in fact, it actually is true that much of what you're going to find in a supermarket is probably not all olive oil. Also, you should know that most olive oils that say product of Italy legally can be brought from any other country and put in a bottle in Italy. So that's no guarantee either. But there is several great American olive oils. One, which is incredibly reasonable, which is Cal California Olive Ranch. And it's on almost all stores now. This has been really checked out uh, by a researcher that it's the real thing. If you go to Costco, they have a square tall bottle that says Toscana, it's Kirkland brand. I've actually been to the plant in Tuscany. I was there about a month ago again. Uh, it has a seal and a stamp that it comes from that plant and it has to come from Tuscany. There's another great California olive oil called Biryani. So it is possible to get reasonably priced olive oil. So don't be afraid of that. And as you know, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. All right. So um, this has been great. And I think it's been really good because you're obviously a writer, but you know, didn't know about this stuff. So Eugenia, how do... How do they find you? Where do they find your book? Wherever books are sold. Um, but it's certainly, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indie, you know, all the online sources where they can also buy my other books, um, like the Mushroom Book that, that you read. Great book. Love it. Thank you. Uh, and then, in, you know, in various bookstores too you know the independent bookstores we got to support them so if you can buy your books there you have to pay a little more but you're supporting uh, uh, independent booksellers and we love them as authors as you know absolutely so this is this is a really particularly if you're if you're curious and want uh, a layman's introduction into a deep subject this is a great way there is some funny stuff uh, particularly if you're in middle age and wondering what's next. This is a, it's a wonderful story. So get, get the book and, you know, thank you again for joining the Dr. Gundry podcast. Uh, for more information about this week's episode, 
take a look at my show notes below or at drgundry.com. In the show notes, you're going to find a survey. I'd love to find out more about you. Take a few minutes to fill it out so that I can do my best to provide information like this show. We try to find guests who are amazing people who have an amazing journey, and this is a great one today. Thank you. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Eugenia, for being on. And remember, I'm Dr. Stephen Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.